So it's the fall, it's moving towards winter, we've been doing this for a while now where you get up and you're driving into work and you get stuck behind a school bus. How many of you enjoy getting stuck behind a school bus? How many of you pray that the school bus is not actually going to stop and pick anyone up? <laughs> Amen, right? You're on the road, now you're late, your coffee's shaking around in your thing, you're trying to drink your coffee and get to work, and uh, you get the school bus and the flashing lights. It can be frustrating, but I want you to think about school buses a little differently this year. I want you to think about them carrying those school kids to school, where they're going to grow and develop intellectually. They're going to learn things that they've never known before. They're going to learn some things they shouldn't learn. But anyway, they're going to learn some things they've never learned before. And then some of them in our county are going to head off to a release time Christian, Christian education program. This year's Christmas challenge, we're just going to raise some money, and we're going to give to the county Christian education programs that are going on. So kids leave school, or sometimes they're before school, and they will go off for what is essentially like a Sunday school class, as I mentioned last week. And some of these kids are not connected to other churches. It's the one place where they're going to hear the gospel in a setting that they're choosing to go to. And so we want to raise some money and bless these organizations throughout our county that are doing this good work on behalf of the Lord. The other thing that I want to mention today is that we want to extend the sympathy of our church to Janet Douglas. Janet lost her husband, Gerald, this week, so we want to be in prayer for them. Let's go to the Lord. Father, thank you that you are a good and gracious and loving God, and you are doing amazing things uh, all around us. All we have to do is open our eyes, and we see the amazing things that you are up to. And so help us, Father, to bless uh, the Christian education release time programs that are happening in our county Help us to be a blessing to them so that they can bless others. And be with Janet and her whole family as they mourn Gerald's loss. We pray for your grace and mercy to be upon them. And as we're here in this place, whether we're here in this room or whether we're just watching online as we can, we pray that you would just meet with us today, that we might experience you. In Jesus' name, amen.
One thing leads to another, folks. That's how it works. Uh, one day, I think it was Rebecca, she was out, I think, walking a lamb, and when she came back, there was a cat that followed her, and she said, can we keep it? And we started feeding the little cat, which we thought was very small, and we named her Daisy, and then we named her Mama Kitty, and then we named her Grandma Kitty, and at one point we had 11 cats around our house, because one thing leads to another, so the moral of that story is don't ever take a cat home. Rebecca also, years before that, said she wanted to show a lamb in the 4-H program, and uh, now we have a stock trailer and a barn. So be careful the decisions you make, because one can go to another, to another, to another, and so that's how it goes. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. It's a passage you're probably very familiar with, but if I'll, uh, you can turn there if you want. I'm going to read for you a big part of this passage from Genesis 3, and what we're going to see is that there's a progression that goes on as one thing leads to another. Let's just jump in. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that it is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was, a, I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Then the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbirth. With pain you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat, curse the ground. Because of you, through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since you were taken from the dust you are, dust you will return. And Adam named his wife Eve, because she became the mother of all the living. The Lord God made the garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God ba banished him from the garden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and on the with flaming swords flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. In this passage, we see a progression, one thing leading to another. The first thing that happens is there's a questioning of God's word. We see it in the very first verse of this chapter. After detailing the creation in chapters one and two, Moses goes on to recount the fall of man here in chapter three. And right here in the first verse, we're introduced to the serpent, where we are told is more crafty than the other animals. And he begins to sow the seeds of doubt in the mind of the woman and her husband and ask God this, about this, ask this question, did God really say, you must not eat of any tree in the garden? The serpent questions God's word, actually misrepresenting it in that question. 
Back in Genesis 2, God said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you not, must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you will surely die. So God's provision when Adam and Eve are in the garden is wide and free. You can have access to all of this except this one. Try this with your kids at home. <laughs> Lay out their favorite desserts, right? Right? You can have ice cream, and you can have brownies, and you can have cookies, and you can have birthday cake, and you can have all this, but you may not have dad's zebra cake. Which one will they want? Dad's zebra cake, because it's the forbidden fruit, right? Lays them all out and says you can have all of this, all this provision, everything that you need to live, access to the tree of life, eternal life, it's all available to you. One rule, you can't eat of this. And so the serpent comes along and says, did God really say that? Did he really say, you won't die? The serpent wants to sow these seeds of doubt in the mind of Adam and Eve. And so the question is not really just about what he said, but it's a distortion of God's character. We experience this in uh, today's day and age as well. We get questions about whether God's word is relevant, right? It's 2021 is what was said all these thousands of years ago actually still relevant to our lives today? Are God's standards still the same or have they shifted and changed with the changing times? You know, we used to do this and now we do this and so things must have changed. Well, we get these seeds of doubt being sown in us all of the time. But that seed of doubt then rolls into misquoting. And so in response to the question about God's word, Eve misquotes God by saying that the prohibition includes we must not touch it. She actually corrects the serpent. No, we have access to all the trees except this one, and we're not allowed to eat from it or touch it. It's like she's putting an extra hedge of protection around this prohibition. Now, we can't eat of it, but we also can't even touch it. How many of you go to the zoo ever? or have been to the zoo. And do you appreciate, as I do, the double fence around the wild cat cage? I do, I do. It keeps me out, which has never, ever been a temptation of mine. I've never gone to the zoo and thought to myself, kids, hold my popcorn, I'm gonna go pet the tiger. Never once. But it also keeps them in. It's a safety thing. The Jews, the Jewish religious leaders, did this with God's law. They put a fence, a hedge around it. They added their extra laws and they interpreted and then codified them so that nobody would get even close to breaking the law of God. And we see this in uh, the sense of this, the beginning of this, and what Eve has to say. You, we can't eat of it, but we can't touch it either. And so there's a, a misquoting of what God has actually said and makes him even more restrictive than he actually is. And then the next thing that happens that leads in is a contradicting of God's word. Uh, the serpent goes in for a kill. The kill shot is this. This is exactly what God said, but the serpent puts himself in the position of deciding what is right and what is wrong. God is wrong. He's lying, and he's lying for a specific purpose. He's trying to hold out on you. So there's been already the questioning of God's word, the misquoting of God's word, and now the contradicting of God's word. And the message is, is a message that we might even play in our minds with uh, children might as their parents are giving them instructions, right? Uh, situation might be a parents are uh, at a school function and they're having to do something in one part of the school and the kids see the playground and they say, can we go to the playground? But it's far enough away the parents don't want them to be there unsupervised because the kids are only in their 30s, so we want them supervised. And so the parents say no. And how do the kids feel? They're angry. They're upset. They're, they're, they feel like their parents are restricting them. As they get older, their parents are ruining their life because they've put limits on them. Right? That's what I, But the view is the parent is somehow holding out. And the serpent says... God doesn't want you to have that because you'll know good and evil and you'll be like him. God is holding you back from something that you deserve, something that is rightfully yours. God is ripping you off. And so God didn't really say that, right? God didn't really say that. He's doing something that he shouldn't do. We hear this all the time. There's a push in our society. You will receive messages constantly. You know what? 
we're moving towards Christmas, aren't we? And so what's the constant message you'll hear about Christmas from our society? Christmas is a time to shop. Christmas is a time to buy things for yourself and for others. Is that the message of the New Testament? Did Jesus come in order to boost retail sales? Right? Right? Is that, is that how it is? I think Black Friday is a bigger holiday than Easter in the United States these days. I think more people are excited about Black Friday, right? They go online and they check the Black Friday ads, try to get the sneak peeks on them. Then they get them in the newspaper, which uh, whoever gets that anymore. But anyway, they check them online and and they go out to these stores early in the morning because it's Black Friday. So the society will sell, uh, tell us things that are absolutely not true and they will contradict what is right. You'll look at those messages that say Christmas is about uh, buying things, uh, that life is about the accumulation of things, that people should be judged by how they look, contrary to what God says, where God says, I don't judge people from the outside, I judge people and their heart. But God's word is constantly contradicted. And so you're getting messages that contradict what is true in God's word constantly, absolutely constantly. So the next phase, the next step, the next progression is replacing God's word. Here's where things really go astray. Eve has doubt sown in her by the questions that the serpent asks and the interchange she has. And then it says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was there watching football. What happens in this verse is simple. And you just have to catch this, how very simple this is. Eve decides she knows better than God. That's it. And this is what happens when we sin. We've decided we know better than God. We know that there's a faster route to the thing we want. We know that the thing we want is legitimate and we need to have it and we deserve it. We know that this is the way to go. We know that God's word says this, but we also know that there's a a more important thing going on over here and we just need to follow that path. We substitute our judgment for right and wrong for God's. Eve knew exactly what God wanted her to do. She got it a little boogered up when she talked to the serpent, but she heard the message. You're not to eat of that. And in very quick succession, she's to the point of deciding, I know better. Man, that looks pretty good. That looks like that would be good for food. It's desirable for gaining wisdom. I'll be like God. I'll I'll have that. That'll be awesome. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to go ahead and do what I know I shouldn't do. I'm going to replace God's revealed word for my judgment. Right? I know better. We know that the Bible says that you're a slave to the one you borrow from, and yet we borrow constantly in order to have what we want and have it now. We know that God says we ought to love our neighbor, but when our neighbor does something against us, we replace love with either revenge or at least a cold shoulder. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I'm not going to wave to them anymore. I'm just going to ignore them. We know that we shouldn't steal, but we'll give it back. We know that we shouldn't cheat, but we also know God doesn't want us to get a bad grade on a test, so we're going to go ahead and do a little looking at our neighbor's paper, assuming we sit next to smart people. Right. We regularly second-guess God's word and we replace our judgment with his. And so the next logical conclusion is rebellion against God's word. Eve simply took it and ate it. She moved from doubting to misquoting to replacing to rebelling. What she thought about God and what he had to say, eventually she lived out. I believe that I know better than God. I believe that God is really trying to hold something back from me. I believe there's freedom outside of what God has told me, and so I'm going to pursue it. That's the nature of sin. She thought she knew better, and then she acted on it. It's a natural progression. I've seen it happen in people's lives. Over a long period of time, uh, people who have gone from trusting in what God says living in accordance with it, and then beginning to doubt whether that was really what God wanted or not. Then surrounding themselves with people who also were not sure or were sure God didn't really mean that. And then eventually those doubts became a new judgment about what God actually said. And then there was a setting aside of what he said to do what I want. 
and then a living that out and actually rebelling against God and doing what I want. Do you find yourself questioning really deep down what God says? It's a sign that sin is knocking at our door, giving us the opportunity to rebel against God. But the next level in the, or the next move in the progression is guilt and shame. And we see that in here. The progression continues. Adam and Eve eat of the fruit. Their eyes are open. They see themselves in, as naked. And then shame and guilt ensue because they try to cover their own nakedness. They, they go out and sew fig leaves together because they realize that they're naked. And then God comes calling as God always comes calling. And they don't want to be seen by him. They've given up the possibility of walks together in the garden. They're going to go off and hide from God because they don't want him to know what they have done. What they hoped for was freedom and some control in their lives that they felt like they didn't have, but what they got was guilt and shame. And they hide as we often hide when we do something we shouldn't do. Or we work to cover up what we've done by making up for it. We stay in the darkness because we fear the light, but guilt and shame find their way in. It's It's the natural consequence of violating God's law. Covering and hiding. It's like a child that breaks their mother's favorite vase. They either sweep up the pieces and throw it away and they hide it under other garbage or they try to glue the thing back together and pretend that nothing went wrong, hoping that their mother won't be observant enough to see all the glue lines. We naturally try to escape the consequences of our choices. It's just built into us now. It's a natural progression from guilt. And then we move on to the next. We attempt to blame Right? One way to alleviate your guilt is to blame someone else. Yes, I did it, but if you understood why I did it or who really pressed me to do it, then you would know I did it, but it's really not my fault. Uh, we have this uh, conversation around the shooting range, right? To go out to the shooting range and you're not shooting very well and then you go back and talk to your friends and you say, I really don't know what happened. I don't know if it's the gun or the ammunition. <laughs> but certainly never the person shooting the gun, right? That never happens, right? Right, we, we want to push the blame on someone else. We want to press into somebody else. And so uh, Adam uh, immediately, as he's confronted by God, immediately blames God and blames the woman. The woman you gave me, so it's not just her fault, it's your fault too, God. So it's at least the woman and your fault. It's definitely not my fault that I took and I ate of the fruit that I knew I wasn't supposed to take and eat. When we face guilt, we feel better if for only if temporarily, if we can shift it to somebody else. What we really need to do is confess. What we really need to do is, uh, what Adam should have done was said something like, yes, God, I ate from the tree you told me not to. And I listened silently while the serpent was talking to Eve and saying things that weren't true and questioning your character. And I sat silently and I ended up taking the fruit and eating it and it was my fault. And then, of course, Eve, she blames the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. So what about her own part? She could have said, the serpent came with these crazy thoughts about you and your word. And instead of telling him to be quiet, I entertained those thoughts and I allowed them to get into my heart and I made new new judgments about you based on what he had said. And so I ended up eating it. It is my fault. And then, of course, the serpent has no one to blame, right? Do you find yourself making excuses? When confronted with having done something you shouldn't do, Hey, I broke that dish, but you made me so mad, right? We start shifting the blame to somebody else. None of this sounds very first Sunday at Advent-like, does it? Not feeling it, are we? We don't even have the candle up here to light and say, it's the first Sunday at Advent, right? But here's where it comes. The final point, the anticipation of a Savior, Think about this just for for a moment, right? It's the third chapter in the Bible. The first two chapters are taken up by creation and God's provision and the setting out of how things are supposed to be. The third chapter is really dominated by our choice as people to violate God's law. So you think, man, chapter three is terrible. And then the last part of this chapter, God is talking to Adam and talking to Eve about what's going to happen to them as a consequence for their sin. But he starts with the serpent, and in, the, in what he says to the serpent lies the anticipation of a Savior. There's hope 
nestled in the very third chapter of the Bible, which has been dominated by sin and rebellion and questioning God. Right there in the third chapter, in the punishments that God lays out for the serpent, he says that there's going to be one born of the woman who's going to crush your head. And so right there we have the anticipation of God's amazing work in sending Jesus to die for our sins and cover our sin. And a little bit later in the chapter, we find out that God replaces the fig leaves with skins. So let's start there for a minute. It's God's grace that is just infused in this. He comes calling. He comes looking for Adam and Eve. He knows what's going on. It's not like God's like, well, I wonder where they are. God knows exactly where they are. He knows exactly what happened. He's not confused. He's not unaware. He comes down. He, hey, where are you guys? Well, we're hiding. Yeah, I know you're hiding. <laughs> and I know why you're hiding. You're hiding because you violated my law. But he comes after him. He pursues them. Think about Advent as we think about the birth of Christ. Christ's birth is the beginning of a part of God's plan that gets enacted in human time where God is pursuing us. Jesus didn't come to the earth to catch us doing something wrong. He came to the earth to call us back into the family of God. God enters the garden after sin and does lay out consequences and punishments, but in the midst of it, he's doing gracious things. He's pursuing. He's creating, he gives them these skins. It's the first time there's a sacrifice where an animal loses its life to cover the sin of people. And that's a prelude to the system that is in, in place during the Old Testament times where animals, their lives are sacrificed to cover the sins of people. But it's only a temporary system until Jesus comes to die once and for all for us. From a woman will come one who will crush the serpent's head. That's the message of Advent. Even back in Genesis chapter 3, an anticipation, a waiting a longing for that time to come. And then it came. And so we celebrate the coming of Jesus. We celebrate Advent, meaning we celebrate remembering the birth of Jesus and what that means. And then we also are still waiting for his second coming when he will return and everything that is wrong will be made right. Father, help us as we continue to move closer to Christmas to be reminded that there is a waiting, but the hope of a savior and the hope of being rescued and the hope of our sin being dealt with has existed since the very beginning. Thank you for Jesus coming. Help us to love you and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.